if they manage to get Shadi, the the thing is done. If they manage to get shot, because I know Central African Republic wants to be part of that, they just Copy. land luck. Copy. You know that it's recording, right? Yes, I I, I um, don't mean to be rude here, but uh, there is a, a little bit of an experiment that has been going on with Toby and uh, and Wyatt having a post recording uh, recording in a, in a sense because there tends to be often post conversation some more and uh, mm -hmm. you know we can actually just partition this up as a small part because mm -hmm. the, the conversation is good and still relevant. Mm -hmm. and what Vosh is saying here is that like what uh, yeah. what uh, Macchiadi was alluding to in the very beginning, right? So that we opened the panel with that with chat right now we're done with the whole panel and we're back at chat post post talk yeah. it's like yeah if you see if it's chat if, if they if chat joins the party so they basically open the door for central african republic to to join because that country got a lot to offer and guess what wagner is there this is where the Chinese are working. Guess who's down there? Congo. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I kind of gotten that impression that the it will be making like just perfect sense for the Chinese to be hiring uh, Russian PMCs for their own security down there in Africa, which you know may also be conveniently going hand in hand with the political partnerships that they're otherwise operating with there. And so it's like. It, it yeah, because you know, because you know all this Al Qaeda shit. You know they need security. China needs security because and, trust me, Africa, have, Africa didn't used to be like this. It's terrorists and stuff. As I said, Out of nowhere, you, there is a lot of them there. And that's what I was about to say. And I, I keep saying this for some reason. These terrorists keep appearing in nations that have strategic you, resources. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. like out of, out of nowhere, imagine, there is terrorists in Africa. Mozambique that has like almost zero Muslims. All of a sudden, we have to we have to address this. There. We will have That's to address crazy. this for the next one when we are talking about how do you you go about with the, you preventing and not just being cool, but you're going to industrialize and all those kind of things. We got to put this into we put we got to put this question mark. How do you just with, you know, without manufacturing, without industry, no apparent transportation or road or anything like that. You just happen to have gold or oil or something like that. And voila, there's weapons there. They're just like, boom, the weapons there. And uh, some, someone who can use those weapons. It's, uh, and it just happens with a, a striking regularity. How, how, if you can solve that one, I think you can, you're well on your way for industrialization. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and, and these people popping up in countries where they, they don't agree with, with the U.S., you know, you're like, yeah. wait a minute, how come ISIS never fights Israel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the other thing I would like to say is like, how, how the, they have more, they have more, basically more money and they don't run out of money and weapons. But when the other military countries need, need help from France and other countries to come to help them out. I don't, I don't, that's, that, that's something, something I kind of confused. How does this tell people still keep having that money? Yes, they don't run out of money. What about the government from other countries can't even able to afford like enough bullet or enough money to pay their own military. But this people right, can pay their military to do anything else. Cause, because even if these terrorists, even though they look like they're lightly armed, it's very expensive to run a whole military campaign against, let's say, the government of Mali. You know what I mean? Like, that takes a lot of resources. So the question is, where, where are these resources coming from? At the end of the day, they, they have to have somebody backing them who is outside the country. And the French have been blamed for that by, 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 the, government, by the government of Mali. They were blamed at all. Hey, I think you guys are sponsoring these guys. <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of, it, would that be, because we're talking about, like, if you're supporting France, because that seems to be, like, a common denominator, if you support France, then you're going to get cooed, but, no, you, you, you should also be a friend of the United States, that's usually very helpful in many ways, so, if you can kind of get rid of France and be a friend with the United States and still maintain partnership with China, you're well on your way to get industrialized, but That's, I think you know, in the United you know, States, you know, open. if I was if I was Macron before I start pointing my finger to Russia or China, I would ask United States, "What the fuck are you doing? 
What the fuck are you doing? All these people involved in this queue, they were trained by the United States. Ah, yes. Wyatt pointed that out. That, were, that was one of the reasons he actually suspected yeah. that the Americans yeah. have a lot more in this yeah. than... Because uh, it... Vitoria Nula went to Niger, talked to the guys, and sure. left, like, you know, yeah, what the fuck was she doing there? Yeah, that, no that is knows. very suspicious, but uh, has Victoria Newland been wandering around or have been, uh, similar emissaries been sent around to, uh, for example, uh, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso? I know Guinea has had a more uh, connection with the United States as far as, but, um, but um, like, uh, is, it, is it the same with, because I get the impression that, yes, yes, you can e easily see that, that, like, if the Americans are, maybe not having a problem with it, and maybe they might even indeed be behind it. And that may be the case for Niger, that may be the case for Jones, but I'm not sure if that's actually the... I think each of them have, like, some... Uh, they, they seem to have some fairly distinct uh, outsets uh, that, that uh, like, a Burkina Faso seems to have, like, a, for example, a very long legacy of... Uh, it's, a, like, the Thomas Ankara, and, and, you know, he's... From what I know, you know, Adam, not an expert. He strikes me as a... Anyway, coping. So, there's something so you say there. You say that you say that you want to be friends with the U.S. Let me tell you something about the U.S. If they mm -hmm. put a foot on your land, they will never leave. Yeah. If they get there, <laughs> they will never go. I'm telling no. you, they're gonna corrupt your whole elite. If you're go, you, you're, go, you're going to be like you're going to be like Georgia, where an unprofit organization seems to have more power than the government. You know, yeah. like you. Americans are very risky. They are very risky. And it also depends with the level of which you interact with them. If you start yeah. hanging out with, with, CIA, with, with CIA people, you have opened another can of worms wow. you'll never be able to deal with. Look, they will... look, 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 look at Vladimir Putin. Look at Vladimir Putin. Look at Vladimir Putin. No, no, if you I... see... This, I have to say this because this sums up what the Macchiati just said. And this comes straight from a very well-revered, well, not revered, but well-known American politician and statescrafter, and that is Henry Kissinger. And he said, being a friend, no, being an enemy of the United States is dangerous, but being a friend is lethal. So, yeah, maybe you don't want to be a friend of the United States. But okay. You want to avoid them. The only way you do that is what China does. You hear that Joe Biden is be trying to get Xi Jinping on the phone, but Xi Jinping is not picking up. That's all you have to do. Look, <laughs> look, look, look at Vladimir. Look at Vladimir Putin when he go in power. All these countries in the West, they were like, "Wow, this guy is the one." Oh, speaking of Putin, uh, I was thinking of uh, this guy in Eritrea, Aferetki, is it? He, he is, uh, this guy is quite, Rocky, uh -huh. He's quite a character. I, I like. I, I don't know all that much about Eritrea, but I do know enough that this is a very interesting... Like, he's, it, it he's, he's, ask, he's asking for democracy in Eritrea, trust me. He's asking for democracy. Oh, you mean at least you're going for a democratic state? The United States is going to try to kill him. That's oh, they are democracy. trying. Oh, my God. E Eritrea, yeah. you did know, Eritrea is heavily sanctioned. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. they are really functional. And the, the way it is is this, and this is something people have not figured out. So people think that the only way to run a poor country is by getting a lot of money and buying expensive stuff. In reality, most of the problems any country faces have a solution that's available on YouTube. We're not talking about heavy investors. If it comes to uh, to agriculture, like I did this agriculture class of how to farm in arid areas, a very simple technology that I think the Germans came up with. You take a piece of, 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 of a, a tree, like a branch or dead tree, you bury it in a ditch, and then you grow plants on top of it. Not only does it act as fertilizer, it also retains a lot of water in the soil. So those farms that have that sort of a technology, you see they're always green, but the area around them is all dead. That simple technology you, you can learn from YouTube that a whole was, country can I, I actually, actually apply for themselves. I, you know? I can actually not agree more with you because I do actually employ many of, like I've looked into those things for now uh, many years, I think five to 10 years. Uh, like a 
I, I, I like, I've usually been like a science geek. I like to look into like how chem, do hobby, hobby chemistry on my kitchen bench and stuff like that. So like when it comes to like this, now, now that I kind of own my own plot and so forth, I, <clears throat> my, my main focus when it comes to everything outside, no fucking lawns. I'm just going to have things that either look nice, like trees and stuff, fruit trees preferably, or something to grow food on. And, you know, in that process, you know, then I'm like thinking like, okay, what about fertilizer, right? And minerals. And, and I'm kind of familiar with all the elements of the periodic table, no one but heart by heart and so forth. So I'm, I'm kind of like, okay, where's the natural inflow rate for me and outflow rate? And, you know, when I kind of look through all that, then it's it becomes like, okay, having done that as a hobby and now being able to put that a little bit in practice and then viewing it in, in Ghana, for example, then I saw a whole lot of that was reapplicable. And, it, you know, you have to, of course, adapt to the ecosystem and plants you're reducing in the seasons and all that kind of stuff. But but ultimately, you, you could you could still, if you had first the mentality of a closed loop system, you could get really far with very little. And yeah, it might be a little bit more effort, but honestly, not really. It's just like, it, because once you get to a certain point of the of the, the soil having kind of reached a certain kind of maturity of a sense, the, the maintenance is, uh, you know, the work involved is, is ridiculous compared to the yields you get. So, and I, and I saw this like firsthand when I was in Ghana as well, a, a small farmer, he had a very small plot of land. Very awesome dude. I, I had to go to that village twice just to kind of get to the, you know, in part to visit this guy. Uh, he had plenty of different type of uh, plants and uh, and uh, and the fruit trees and stuff like that. Uh, grow. And he also had reared some goats in, in fences and stuff like that. You know, sure he needed still to get some input because it was a very small plot. But the 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 uh, he had lived there for a long time, you know. He had been developing it, and and the, it was clear, like his profession was a hunter, so it was clear he knew what it like. He had he had established um, a small little catfish pond, uh, and but, but just redirected a river to go through the cash cat to his uh, property, and then back. And he had, had an agreement with his neighbor, right? And that's all it took. And indeed, actually, when they did that, they managed to make it easier to irrigate the sugar cane fields that were crossing from his property to the other. And so now I'm going into ramble here, but yeah, like you're saying, there's so, actually a lot to be said in when it comes to actually getting the. Uh... There's, there's a lot, and the one country learned the lesson from this micro assistance of the people is Vietnam. Vietnam does a very good job at like a simple Chinese windmill or Vietnamese windmill that's like twenty twenty thirty dollars from like you know or from like Alibaba or whatever, right? That thing will be so be it ends up being so beneficial to a farmer in his household that you can actually do it. But that's a government as a whole focusing on that. If you listen to the uh, Communist Party of uh, of Vietnam talking, the things they talk about, you won't even believe it. They talk about things like the price of rice, how do we bring it down? They 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 are like, okay, we have to restrict how much we export rice so that the price of rice may go down. Like, they think about things that actually affect people. But when you go to a country like Kenya, the president is like, what do I, there's nothing I can do. And he's right. There's nothing <laughs> he can do. Because he has zero powers. He has zero powers. And the institutions are not geared towards helping people. That's the biggest difference people don't know. Most of these institutions in every country are geared towards helping one or two people. It's not I about don't... the masses. It was never about the masses. I don't know in your country, guys. My in Angola, we buy we buy rice from EU. I've been all over Europe. I've never seen a fucking rice factory or whatever. You know, we even buy vegetables from Europe. Oh my God! Yes, the but... product the product that can produce from Portugal, produce from EU, is ten times much expensive. Yes. I asked myself, what I, the fuck is that? I, I, I saw that when I was on the malls in Accra, and I, I, I came over the cucumber that <laughs> now is fairly expensive. Now maybe it's up to $3. <laughs> it's still a lot. But, but a, a, no, maybe not $3. I said $2.50. Uh, but a, the, and that's a, like a, it, that's from, a, that's almost twice from what it was a year and a half ago. And a, a, then when I was in Ghana, because then, then it will be like one to some dollars, 1.7 for the dollar for that cucumber. But in that, that mall, that same cucumber, that went for five, about $5 uh, 
uh, translated. I think it's a bit hard to remember the CD rate, exchange rate right then, but it was early on. So, yeah, it, it was definitely at least five dollars for that single cucumber, if not if not six dollars, probably six, closer to six. So, yeah, I, I, and I was shocked. I was like, "Wow, who the hell can yeah. actually afford buying this?" Like, no, no one. I mean, I wouldn't be uh, oh, willing yeah. to pay that much for a cucumber. So, how can people around here even consider buying it? It's absolutely insane. Why would you even import something like that? Really? Yeah. Of course, that, it that, is that, 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 segment of the population. Co copy those are usually mm -hmm. for occasions like you know like, you know these people have like you know like in, my, in guinea they just give an example people eat more uh, the, the people that eat more meat like daily they are the people that they call like the rich people or, or middle class if you eat meat usually you eat it like uh, three or four days one time or, or once in a week they eat more like fish so that's how sometimes it is whenever something is too expensive they usually, if, if it's low income, they only eat it one time a week or something in the equation, like, like there's, there's a wedding or there's a, or something, basically it's something that's very, very special, basically. So, so basically, you can, you, so what you're saying, you can actually get really good deals on, because sometimes I came across something that, you know, I would go to the mall because I would not be able to get it elsewhere or it would be too problematic to get it elsewhere. A, or just whatever convenience, but, but the prices were, were, often a deterrence. I did not do my main shopping there unless I kind of felt it was necessary or whatever. But, but uh, what you're saying basically, like if, if uh, I am in touch with some rich folks who tend to be going there and they might be having a, a birthday party or something going on, I might be, you know, be having a hunch of there being a good deal next week, which I can capitalize on, fill my fridge and, and what have you. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. So one thing I was about to say, because he was talking about like I was saying, see, Guinea like to be like uh, 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 independent and they like to be neutral because you see they try to work with uh, uh, America, China and Russia t uh, together. But it, I know, it's, as you say, it's very difficult. But usually the leaders that came up always, they always work with France first. But in the middle, like the second term or the uh, uh, middle of the first term, usually they switch to US and then China and, Ru and Russia. They usually always kick France out of the way. That's when usually you started hearing propaganda that this person doing this, and then there's all the schools. That's what usually happens. Oh, and then with the coups, is also, I think, important to mention what was happening around uh, Russia because something Putin said. And people don't, I don't know if you guys remember or you heard about this. Putin said that they will not tolerate any uh, color revolution in their backyard. Do you know how big of a deal that is? That that no. was said publicly? Because it can be said secretly and uh, whatever, right? He said it openly. And that was after Kazakhstan, right? This is a country that has said, imagine how much trust those governments now have in Russia, knowing that if somebody tries to cool them, the Russian military yeah. can be there very quickly. That's yeah. a, That's... Now, that, that, that's a government that can actually sleep well and at least try and do what it can on behalf of the people because now the, the, a fear has been removed, you know. Like, oh, my God, look at, look at what, is, what is happening in Georgia. In the, in, the, in the streets, you have all these people from all these universities by George Soros all over the freaking streets saying this, saying that. And I'm like, listen, I, I don't believe in being a totalitarian. But there's no way in my country, if I was the leader of a country, there's no way we are having some freaking college people and some think tanks and everything having that much power in my country. Oh, hell no. I would rather be called anything. I will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and, and I'll defeat them. Like like what uh, it was, remember the, the fight between uh, Putin and uh, the guy from uh, Yukos, Khodorkovsky. That, that see that, that that was the time I ever paid attention to Putin, the first time I ever because I was like, wow, that dude may be may be different. So they fought with Kodokos. Kodokos wanted to sell Yukos to Chevron Texaco, but again, if he sells Yukos to Chevron Texaco, that means, and remember Chevron Texaco, it had George Bush and Condoleezza Rice on their board of directors. So you sell a big Russian company to Chevron Texaco, America has you by the balls. 
right? But Putin could not do anything to stop it because constitutionally they can do it. So Putin did a gamble, and this is the first time I've ever seen Putin gamble. That means that that was a big deal to him. He said, if this deal goes through, he will resign as president. You know, before he said that, Russians were looking at this as a game between, oh, let's turn on the TV, let's watch a new episode of Putin versus the oligarchs. But when Putin said he was going to resign if this deal goes through, everybody, everybody in Russia was like, whoa, 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 hold up. Okay, this is kind of getting serious now. You know? <laughs> Eventually, he, he, that is him going to the public for help. That's, that's what he basically did. And guess what? The deal did not go through. Khodorkovsky was thrown in prison, uh, which he deserved because Khodorkovsky is not a good guy like people think he is. He's, he's a really, really a horrible mafia boss. But that is, you have to be ready to fight with these people because enemies of the country are not just people who sat down and are, are scheming behind the scenes. No, it's the people who are also being used against the interests of yeah. their own country. This mm -hmm. is this one of the things you never let these people, you know, opposition party, get funded by international countries. Mm -hmm. Once they're doing this, your country is fucked up. I even wonder why that's even a conversation. If you're getting funded by an international uh, country, you're a fucking spy. Yeah. Is there any other way to look at it? You're a spy. <laughs> no. There's no other way to look at it. Yeah, look at Armenia. I was uh -huh. watching. I was watching some documentary last night about Armenia. I was like, wow, the pictures. You know, I've seen Nazi Pelosi there, and I was like, wow, this country is fucked up. So fucked up. Mm -hmm. They sold the country cheap, really mm -hmm. cheap. Mm -hmm. Never, Man. never, ever let your opposition part be funded by another country. Oh, yeah, and something that's else... What the CIA, that's that, what the CIA does. That, that. CIA is good else that, at doing this kind that of thing. shocked me that, that Russia passed was uh, they passed a law a couple of years ago that if you're a member of the, the, uh, the, the, the state Duma or their parliament, you can't have any other job but that. You cannot be a member of any board of companies. You cannot... And... They signed unanimously. Do you know how difficult it would be to tell African politicians, hey, you can't have a company? They, I would the, be hard the, to imagine. The Russian government only allowed if you're an athlete or if you are an artist. With the speed, I think about that in the United States, even. That, that would be unheard of doing something like that. Like, what are you calling? Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah, they would. You see, they would. You see how many <laughs> you see, you see how many this United States senator uh, have share in these private companies. How many of them? That's what all they do. Uh huh. Well, oh, the revolving so, door example. So, like that. That's a good example. Of what Macchiari said. Like, you know, the the revolving door in the United States. It's so it's so much now. There's there's before it used to be kind of like a joke because it used to be like. After they quit, they go into a board. But here you look at Anthony Blinken. As far as I know, he's still on the board of the Raytheon. I think it was Raytheon. And he's also Secretary of State. And it's absolutely... It's like... How, like, how, like so who has the most to gain from having a war started? Well, I think I know one person to <laughs> start this. <laughs> so what I would like to add, for giving an example, if, if they want to end the corruptions, first of all, mm -hmm. they need to start paying all these people really well, like the, the people that work for the government. Even teachers, they need to start paying everybody well. And also, anyone who works for Guinea government should do not send their kids abroad, because that's where, that's where the corruption starts. Whenever they start sending those kids abroad, then that's when they get that, you know, okay, you know what, I know your kid go to Yale, or your kid go to, go to uh, uh, Columbia, or, 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 or other schools. If, if you don't do the right thing, I'm just going to call the dean, and he's just going to close, he's going to kick him out. So basically, that's, that's the other problem that Guinea have, because there's a lot of Young kids that I know that the parents like they like head of a, or like a military or something. They have more better homes than people that work here. They have more better apartments. They better, they're going to school here and yeah. they're like living. They don't do nothing. I'm telling you, they don't do nothing. 
You don't do nothing. All you do is you just go to school, come back, and then go party and then eat. And well, but, uh, but one moment here. I can think in, let's just take Guinea, for example, right? It's like, yeah. because I, I, I get what you're saying. I would say it's generally something to be, if it's not absolutely true, then it's definitely possible and so forth, depending on the case and situation. But that's precisely my point here, right? Is it the case and situation, maybe, maybe you, like, uh, if you have Cuba, for example, as a country that is more or less on par, it has historically speaking very good relation with African countries, and it is, you know, not going to be on the si siding with the United States, right? Yeah, especially on global. They're not going to side with the United States anytime soon, right? So you can definitely have, a, you know, to share some, uh, you know, as a part of uh, developing your own uh, educational system as well, because that one is, you know, as far as I've understood it, one of the problems that. Um, Momieni uh, told me was, uh, I think it was he who told me that, and this one I have noticed was the case when I was in Ghana as well. Uh, uh, that was that the, the schools with higher education, yes, you could find that in the state, but, but you would not have any opportunities thereafter. And you would actually even be, be prompted and advertised very often in those state sponsored schools to get a, you know, a job here abroad first and then, you know, whatever, if you wanted to do it later. But of course, we also know the story here that causes the brain drain and not really the, the development of, in the country. And the mentality was very prevalent there in Ghana. Like when you wanted to go to a school, a good school, that was a private school. And who owned the private schools? Well, most of them were, you know, sure, there were some of the oligarchs there, there were, and there were Ghanaian schools. But what model were they using? Exactly the same. Right? So there were, there were no difference in essence. And so, and here, like, you don't, uh, like, it's just like uh, teachings on history, for example, is, is going to be slanted in that direction, which is absolutely absurd. Why, why would you, but, but you know, I, I do actually understand it, the, the, the insanity of it, because in Norway, it is also kind of on the standardized. It, it's, uh, it's not, it's not that bad. We still have like, you know, cultural aspirations, yeah. and, but, you, but, you, but, 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 but like, I, I was kind of shocked. There were many things that, that, that I knew about Africa that that, that uh, they didn't know, for example. And I, I'm talking about, for example, I was like, for example, the, the size, the, where's uh, Liberia compared to Nigeria, for example. Like the, those kind of things, geography, particularly bad of the African continent. Maybe they would know where the United States is, that, that would be it. But, and, and, and Britain, they would know Britain because it stands out and they know Europe is there. But, but like Africa, no, no, that was like, um, pretty much missed all the time, and I'm talking about adults here, which which was uh, like, yeah, oh, that was like, quite a thing for me to. Uh... By the way, speaking of speaking of, of of kids from abroad, have you guys noticed these new African politicians who are young and hip, and they all have like skinny ties, and they're all talking really good. You know what I'm talking about? They're all these. There's a crop of new freaking leaders who are like, all, they look like they just came from TikTok. Right, and then they, and then they are always like, they are always talking like, how can I put it? Like they're like, oh, innovation and 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 building a cloud and do, they they talk like that. Like they, they talk as if every you know, they, they talk as if they are getting their speeches from the BB, internet. The BBC BBC English. Yeah, and 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 they're all now being hailed by all these news organizations all over the world. Oh, that's the new generation. I'm like, dude, if that's the new well, generation, we're fucked. Because yeah. listen to them. These people, <laughs> they do not. They're so uh, most of these young politicians. Like I, I know the obsession with people saying we need new politicians because the old ones were not working. The only problem is there's no evidence to show that young politicians are better than the old ones. There's none. Because the young politicians are absolutely no. out of touch. I said this they, they, before. They, if you are good. over seventy-five, no, no, this, where, where you do should, most if you're over seventy-five, you should go. Wait, wait, wait. Where do most but politicians actually want... are derived from? Most politicians are generally from a, a fairly wealth, relatively wealthy or influential one way or the other, right? So that's that. Then when you see this kind of uh, dynamic, th this has been very common now for quite a while, right? It's gone to the point where you find the same similar, uh, similar kind of system dynamic, for lack of better words, with when it comes to centralization, right? Centralization might be very effective. And this system here, you know, this is good for kind of controlling in a sense without controlling overtly maybe. Mm -hmm. But then you see over time, it gets a problem, namely that it has, it gets detached from the general population. 
necessarily the people are operating within these institutions and so forth as they are, you know, they, they get naturally enclosed within their own kind of culture and community, so to speak, for it's uh, referred to sometimes as an institutional mentality. And we can see that when it comes to at least Western politicians that, you know, maybe they're not filthy rich, but they're certainly not of the, the uh, you know, the poor and downtrodden or something like that. They're certainly not the most controversial one. They, may, they might be they doing the lip service and saying a lot of things that are indeed true. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's as far as they're going to go. It's only going to go on the surface level and appealing to emotions and, and all that kind of jazz, which which is why I'm also kind of like, you know, I'm not really, I'm, I'm very like pro-democracy on a decentralized level. And then one tries to find a federalized solution. That's my ideal way of going about it. It seems to make sense to me. But uh, at the same time, I also see that the circumstances of our human societies, they don't necessarily, you know, I can, you know, I may prefer that, but it's certainly not something I'm going to be thinking, oh, this is the best solution for here and there. So I certainly can understand what you guys have been basically saying when it comes to the authoritarian. I'm sure there are a lot of people who are going to be wanting to say like, oh, these are just a, a semi-communistic, a pro-authoritarian, pro-dictatorship, whatever, and so forth. But, but uh, like, I... I kind of get it because if you have democracy in the way that we have here, you're very susceptible. It's one of the reasons I, I'm pretty sure the Americans they, and many Western powers that are in, able to influence in that way insist on keeping a model where you have the cyclical term, preferably bipartisan, where you can always support the proposition. And, and yeah. is, is, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if the Scandinavian countries have gotten everything they need and their, and their, and their bellies are full, they can worry about yeah. uh, they can worry about you know uh, uh, what new gender there is, they have, which is okay, which to... is okay. But for most countries in the world, they don't care about much because, like, the, their immediate needs, and that's why I, I, I quoted the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Their immediate needs are a problem. But if you live in a country where you throw food away because you have too much of it then you can worry about other things, you know. So for, for African countries, when, we, when we're having problems with electrical blackouts, when you're having problems with uh, nutrition, when you're having problems with, with, with high crime rates, at that point, what's the need of, 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 of being super democratic? There, there isn't. After we have taken care of these needs, then we can start fighting politically about small, minute things. But I, I no, believe the most important thing is to basically have things. That I'll, I'll give what I'll say something very, very important, and you can actually look this up in any way you can. There has never been a single country that has moved from second world to first world, or from third world to second world as a democracy. None. Democracy yeah. is literally. This this whole uh, political, this whole Western kind of democracy thing, is the worst thing to a poor country. It's nothing but bickering and bickering, and people just keep dying, and the bickering and, still. Goes and, 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 so, and also, I think just as a thing, because this alludes to something when uh, we, I recall a recording with uh, Drew uh, regarding China and stuff, and. And uh, it was an interesting thing because Shadowi opened with, uh, for him, he thinks that the Chinese and Asians, they work so hard, so much, and et cetera. But, you know, when I go went to Ghana, that's something I also noticed. Those who, who did work, they worked really, like, unbelievably hard. Yeah. And uh, the uh, but and then Drew came with the countenance then because he said, yes, that, that was to a large extent true, and it is somewhat true depending on where you are in Asia, but... If you look at, in particular, China, now they have become so accustomed to many of the conveniences, the material things, they kind of, the industrial, they, they kind of expect actually more a, more of a Western lifestyle. And also that they don't have to work so much. So they, sure, they might be more compared to the Westerners, but they are not a, they're no longer a low, low income company, uh, country. Like this is one of the reasons that China is used by the big tech is because they actually have the developed and they, like they have the engineers and they have everyone that can actually do it. That on, the United States don't even have it. That's why they, they are so favored for for U.S. investments there. And so when you take that the massive hierarchy of needs, right? To take take it now. When you're in the stage that you're in, in like if you're at a Sahel Federation, then your population, you know, like if they they have been 
busting their fucking asses for just to, to think about what you get past every day. You know, that, that's not for everyone, but that's for very many people. And then there's a whole lot of other concerns of, because you know, poverty can be very crushing. And, and here they see like a possibility of a light. There's like new things happen. This is actually, you know what? And, and, you know, and they actually get included, they get involved, right? And you can call this socialism, right? You can call this uh, gulag projects where they're hauling in people for re-education centers and so forth. <clears throat> but honestly, there's nothing wrong with voc vocational training, right? I, because that's what it's really about, right? So it's, it's, a, it's just a matter of the government doing the simple th same thing of like prepping the administration overhead, for example, and facilitating for the, the you know, whatever, right? It's, it, it can, the, 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 Chinese, the, the Chinese would have fought terrorism in Xinjiang yeah. using the American way, which is bombing the crap out of everybody and putting people in black sites and in moving ship containers. Or you can give these people jobs, train them new skills, and resolve the terrorism issue. And guess what? After the vocational training in Xinjiang, there's never been a single terrorist incident. Before that, there used to be, people used to get knifed all the time. Like in train station, somebody's knifing women because women are dressed scankily or whatever. So he guy just decided he's gonna lash it out. Most of that was because that was the, biggest, the, biggest, the biggest joke, the biggest joke, biggest joke that came, the biggest joke that came from America was when they, Start caring about Muslim people in China. I was like, "What the fuck? You were you the one who made made Muslim people looking bad, and now you care about them." That's the thing. I was like, "I was like, wait a minute." So we know you hate Chinese people, but yeah. and we know you hate Muslim people. So, yeah. so now you like Chinese Muslim people. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? You the what? You the problem? You know, you, United States is the problem. A lot of people look at Muslim like, wow, you, you know. But once you get to get to know the Muslim people, you start laughing. Like, fuck you, America, with your fucking propaganda. Yeah, and now they start to care about Muslim, but only from China. Well, I mean, yeah. you guys heard, you guys know that I came with this genocide uh, accusation as well, and Western media, about, oh, who's genocide going, Jim, whatever, and you know, sure, there might be some coercive measures being taken, but genocide is a very strong word. Now, what was the media, the Western media, basing this on? Uh, they were mostly, but pretty much entirely basing it on the statement of one guy who did not substantiate it. He just made a statement, and this guy is. Uh, 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 American born German, uh, I think it was with. Um, I forget his name. The, uh, but I think type, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, and he, he had, he had, uh, from, he had prior, like his family history is uh, tied to the Nazis, but he also has quite a lot of indicators of still being quite into that. And uh, he had made, for example, statements regarding, uh, you know, it was very telling with Jews and stuff like that, which, you know, usually in the Western media, you would have that like, <gasps> oh, look at the Nazis and whatever, but uh, unless it's inconvenient, and of course, that, that never happened. Then then it's actually, don't forget, the, don't don't listen to this Holocaust denier or whatever he is, and I'll just go over for this. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think it's a, like, a, that's yeah. How, it's, it's that's how upside down this planet is, that there's a Nazi who is pretending to care about Chinese people. Like, you can't make this shit up. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine being a comedian trying to like, wow, this is this is ridiculous. How can they do something? Like that? And there's like, oh my god, this is so ridiculous. How do I even make a joke out of this? It, it, it's it's. Yeah. Uh, no, that, yeah, that, I, that's what that this is. So this is so that was no, a, let, let a, good, just, a good experiment just, uh, that was done against China, and it didn't work, and. Now, now nobody's talking about the people of Xinjiang now. So I ask people all the time online, I'm like, wait a minute, is the genocide over? What, 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 oh. why, how, how, how come now you're not talking about Xinjiang? Are, are, the, United, the, the United, the United yes. Nations went there and found nothing. You know, guys, guys, let, let me remind you guys that we're recording. This was only meant to be like 10 minutes, not the oh, no, okay. it's, it's, it's five minutes. No. Uh, for those of you who care to watch this, if this anyway, even... anyway, guys, I gotta go, I gotta go. Walk yeah, in the morning. yeah, you can, these conversations can go on and on. So, yeah, if, if, I know. Shame, still... shame is Sunday, should be on Saturday, yeah. but you know, copying, organize another one, and I'm sure I'll be there. 
Oh, but yeah, next nice. Time, next time we're going to talk about countries no one talk about. Mozambique. Tanzania. No, I want to talk. I, I want to I know what's happening in Mauritania. I forgot that country even yeah. exists. Yeah, we we need to go to this country, you know, let's go to Wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. Okay. Let, let me let me start the recording here. For those of you watching, as you can see, the conversation can go on forever. I'm not sure if this will ever be recorded for you or uploaded for you, but if you are watching, we thank you for that and we hope you have some inputs for it. As you can see, you know, the, this was post panel and we we're already talking about something else all over the board. And so I'll stop the recording now. Uh, bye.